General XO. Salute me when you see me. Hot Music TV, man. We out here on the campus of William & Mary right now at the Muscarelli Museum. It's absolutely beautiful. We've been talking to Stephen Prince all day about the Muscarelli Museum, the chain project, and everything. Uh, you have to be here to see it. Make sure you come out and check out the exhibit. It's supposed to go away in a little while, but then it's moving over to the Sadler Center. So if you don't get to catch it here, make sure you go over to the Sadler Center on William & Mary campus and check out the exhibit. 400 years, absolutely crazy. The stories, the history, everything that we've learned for the past 400 years of black people being in America. Wow. In August 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Point Comfort, Virginia. It carried more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. No aspect of the country we know today has been untouched by the slavery that followed. America was not yet America, but this was the moment it began. Well, my name is Steve Prince. I'm the Director of Engagement and Distinguished Arts in Residence here at the Muscarelli Museum. Uh, I'd love to welcome you to our exhibition called 1619, 2019. And this whole exhibition is basically uh, looking at the history of the 400 years of the first 29 Africans that arrived in Point Comfort, which is now known as Hampton. And we endeavored to create an exhibition that embraced it. So this exhibition is comprised of African Americans and Native American artists that we invited from across the country to engage that theme of the 1619 and what do we look like today. And so as you come into this exhibition, um, we have a series of different artists uh, working in all different types of media, from drawing to painting to printmaking and sculpture. And as you move through, one of the things that we want to do in terms of the experience, when you walk into the exhibition, one of the first pieces of artwork is a well-known artist named Katrina Andrew. And she created these pieces that spoke about the Middle Passage and about so many lives that were lost well, along again, that route. And so the water basically signifies those people that were thrown overboard, those who died uh, throughout that voyage. And she used this ill metaphor um, at the bottom because eels were considered to be something that was discarded or looked down upon as the which the African, um, the African American made body was looked upon as well. But she created a series of pieces to pay homage to those different lost souls. And as we maybe equate somewhere near 2 million people who didn't make the voyage, that became food for the fish and their bodies were, um, became part of the ocean. And as you move the exhibition, you want to kind of create a sense of a middle passage movement. So as you come into this particular space, the great room, you now engage a series of different artworks that are, again, by Native American, African American, both male and female artists represented in the show. Um, another thing about this exhibition, it was a jury show. And so we took, we had some purchase prize winners. And, and for example, this piece here by Delita, uh, Pinchback Martin. Um, she created this piece and she was one of our second prize purchase prize winners. And she's an artist who's known for her mixed media work. As you can see, she's overlaid charcoal. She's come back with um, some painted surfaces where she's using some printmaking materials. But then another beautiful thing she does, she takes and she sews back into it different pieces of fabric and you can see the stitching along the inside of the work. Um, one of the things that she was doing, she used elements from the manifest and elements that allude to the Middle Passage, as you can see the bodies are packed on the bottoms of slave ships. She put them there as a reminder for us to continue to remember that history for, for lest we forget, and we are doomed to repeat those things. As you move, of course, throughout the room, uh, some of the works in the exhibition are part of the permanent collection already as far as the exhibition is concerned, uh, that the museum is on. And one of the things that the museum is, is intentionally doing is trying to purchase more artists of diversity, uh, buying works from African American, Native American, and of course just people of color to, to further enrich this museum so it can become more reflective of the state of Virginia, 
or should I say our nation, or should I say the world? made by an artist out of the Chicago area named Preston Jackson. And he, again, he begins to speak about chattel slavery with his image. The woman's body is impressed within uh, the bottom uh, portion of the composition of space, but then she rises up. And the name of the piece is called Protecting Assets. And so, you, but this piece is made of bronze, where it was originally made in wax, using it with the lost wax casting process called Sierra Purdue. Wax is removed from the mold and it's replaced with bronze. Um, inside this piece, and I'm, I'm one of the vid, um, exhibit, exhibiting the artists in this exhibition, and this piece that I created is called An Allegory of an Old Woman in the Upper Room. And this piece was originally created with a, um, a protest that I participated in that took place in Washington, D.C. in front of the state capitol, um, the U.S. capitol. And this piece was part of that protest because it was alluding to an apology made to Native Americans back in 2010 that was buried within the Senate Appropriations Bill. So I went out with another artist, which was a Native American artist named Elmer Yazzie, and I also went out with a guy named Mark Charles, who is actually running for president right now as an independent, as a Native American. And so we went out on, that, on the mall and I presented this painting as part of that protest. And as you can see in the image, it shows a woman, an old woman inside of her bed. And it ties into a story that, that Mark Charles basically shared and he talked about a great mansion. And in this mansion are these many rooms and there's a great party going on inside of it. But then there's this woman who's upstairs inside the room and she's forgotten, she's old and she's tired. 
And so I thought about that because he was representing that woman who was in that upper room as a representation of the Native Americans. The house was representative representation of the land that was stolen from them through genocide. And so I created another narrative on top of that. So I said, in order for us to enter into that room, there's a certain way in which you got to enter into the room and go in there and engage this woman. And I believe that we must go in there with a certain level of humility to be able to go in and engage her, to learn from her, to acknowledge her. And so I reduced this, this I reduced the adults who are in the left side of the compositional space down to a child who is inquisitive and she goes into the room. But she's gonna get a little bit more than what she's thinking for beyond just meeting this old woman. She's also gonna kind of in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so I'm also speaking about judgment that I believe that will come upon us, this nation, if it does not atone for its sins. And so each one of these horsemen represents some particular aspect as relates to the revelation within the Bible. And so all these different narratives inside this particular show are just being told over and over again. There's another piece right here, a sculptural piece, uh, created by a local artist out of Hampton named Richard Ward. And he's using this a lot of contemporary materials, and one of the materials he uses is called driving. And it's actually an architectural material that's used for a surface, but he's very much into the Adinkra symbols, uh, pulling back a lot of the history, alluding to um, Africa, but pull, pull them in this contemporary way, speaking about this uh, African-American context. To Sky 4 every Sunday at 12.30 a.m. for Hot Music TV, the real heat on the streets. Oh, 
Too much water? Yep. That's okay. Good job. Yay! This exhibition was co-curated by myself, um, uh, Melissa Paris, and Danielle uh, Marietti Lenkos. And the three of us came together. We uh, sought the different artists uh, to be in this exhibition. We thought about all of the, the spacing, the egress. But the, the key thing about this exhibition was drawing upon the stories directly from African Americans and directly from Native Americans to be able to tell their story and not have someone from the outside tell a story about us. And so with that, I thought that for this exhibition, we needed something that was going to be uh, an experiential happening. So I devised this project called The Links. Now, we can think about The Links on one level as a symbol of incarceration or a symbol of slavery. That's one way to think about it. But I think as creatives, I think that we need to think about it a little differently. And so The Links become representative of our connections that are inextricable. Every single one of us are connected by generation, connected by the blood, connected by the cells and the water and all those things that make us up as human beings. And so I devised this project where I took these four by eight foot panels, cut them up into various puzzle pieces, and I had a series of workshops, about 35 of them, take place from last year, from August all the way to November. And we engaged someone in the neighborhood of almost 500 people in the creation of a giant woodcut. So all those various individualized pieces, after the students worked in those different workshops with as young as seven, as old as 87, we pulled them all back together to assemble this puzzle to create these pieces. Then we went outside at the Wren Building. The Wren Building on the College of Women Mary is the oldest continuous academic building in the United States. So it was purposeful that we were on the south side of that building because this institution, which was born in 1693, was a space where they actually bought and sold slaves to keep this institution afloat. Slaves were sold to keep students here at this institution. Slaves built the buildings, cooked the food, washed the clothes, and we don't know how many other stories that are trapped away here in this land. But the idea was to take this project, this contemporary project, pay homage to all those lost souls, all those who were unable to get an education at this institution, and bring them back here, bring those ancestral spirits back, and get us all to engage the truth of that history and that past, but of course, work together to rewrite a new future. And so in this image, as we pulled it all together, we rolled ink on the surface of it, we put paper on top of it, we had a lot of African drummers and dancers present. We had one of our very own, Hermine Penson, who wrote a series of poems, and for that particular day, she wrote a libation poem, and she poured a libation for those ancestral spirits as people yelled out in their mouths, Ashe, which is the power to make things happen. And then at that event, we took an industrial steamroll and we rolled across these panels and we made these prints, these impressions off of those blocks. It was a large public uh, out, outward display that we created. It was on purpose because we needed to wake people up to not forget, to remember, to remember. And so as part of this installation, this thing is 32 feet long that gets created. I wanted to add some other elements to get us to think about the textures and the layers of the story. This character up here is not a representation of Icarus coming from a Eurocentric story, but is actually a representation of the flying Africans. And as one of the stories going, which is tied to a true story coming from the Igbo people, and the Igbo people were right around the area of Georgia. And when those people got onto the, um, were on the slave ship, they took over the slave ship. And when they took it over, they killed all the people that were, that were trying to cap and incarcerate them. And once they got to the shores, 
instead of being captured and going into enslavement, they refused and walked back into the ocean and created a mass suicide. These are the Igbo people. I believe they were in the area right around Nigeria. But I put this contemporary person flying up above, and as you can see, one of his shoes had fallen off of his feet. If you look at the bottom of the composition down here, you'll see one of the tennis shoes down there, and it's an old Nike tennis shoe that I put down there. But you'll note, very close inspection, the tongue of the shoe is a real tongue. The teeth are in the back of the shoe, the nose on the back of the shoe, the eye on the back of the shoe. I'm speaking about consumer culture, about the way in which these material things are just constantly eating at us. And this guy is flying above it. He's transcending or transcending spirit that's ridding himself of these things that are weighing us down. And so this is a call for us right now to continue to transcend, to continue to ascend to those things that are greater, our ideals that will keep us alive as people, to continue to fight and push for things that are truth, out about justice and about love about family, about community. And so over here, the guy that stands here on the end holding the fish. The fish is the one part is about sustenance, but as you look at it, just as I made an allusion to the pieces as by Katrina Andrew who came in, you'll note there's a man's face on the end of the fish. So he's fishing for his family to bring about the food and in terms of keeping them all alive and keeping things afloat. But also, we also gotta remember the troubled issue that's embedded in the waters. And then over to the other side of it, perhaps this is his wife and she's pregnant and a new life is to come. And again, it bespeaks of the responsibilities that we have to continue to pass this story on from one generation on to the next. So when we think about 1619 and 2019, the question of the show was about for us to look back to see where we are, but imagine where we could go. Thank you. It's called Lemonade. When the world gives you lemons, you make lemonade. You make lemonade. And that's what we did as African Americans. We constantly made lemonade over and over and over again because it gave us the worst bit. So this is the piece that was created. It's a mixed media piece. All of this was done in one month. Woodcut, acrylic painting, bronze casting. These three in the middle, halfway through the class, the three women are still alive. 1967 students, they graduated in 1973. These women are alive and enjoying very well. They came to class. Oh, wow. We did a round table talk with them, a round circle talk, and had a conversation with them. They were asking all questions about what was it like being a student here in 1967. And ironically, where were they? In Jefferson Hall. <laughs> and we know the story of Jefferson. Yeah. But they were in Jefferson Hall on the campus, and those three women shared what they went through to the students right now. I mean, and then I said, okay, we're going to take it to the next level. So we put Vaseline on those three women's faces, <laughs> and we took plaster masks off of their faces. Yes. And check it out. Every student in the class walked and put the plaster mask on their face. So every student touched those three women. Yeah. They felt their faces, the yeah. contours of their faces, and those women sat there while we all put the plaster mask on their face. Then we popped them off and went downstairs, and I put wax into the molds. Pop them out, put the channel systems on it, put the molds on top of that. We burned it out and we cast all three of those faces in bronze. I did nothing to their faces. They're the only three faces that were not touched. So these become three symbolic representations of those women coming into the school. I had them touching together, overlapping their bodies as they move in because they're disrupt, you know, they came in with who they are. I did them in black and white so they would stand out. I put them on this color field and it tells a story of, of the past of William and Mary. And it sells of a savory path, slavery path, and this window structure is the shape of the window on the Wren building. But I actually made it also a slave ship. The lemons are falling from the sky. I told you that they washed the clothes of the people on this campus. Yeah. But I made them red stain, a blood stain. That's stuff you can't wash out very right. easy. So that's all out there, hanging on online. Everybody in the community can see it. They're working those fields, but they also, their spirituality, is also dubbed by that same tool because the fields became a means by which they used the fields making quilts from the cotton, yeah. dyeing it, and making symbols to help them escape from the south to the north. Yeah. 
the Holy Spirit engulfing around the woman as she does a praise dance, you know, in the composition. The background is called an hourglass. There's a beautiful book by Raymond Dobar and Jacqueline Tobin. It's called Hidden in Plain View, where they postulate that slaves and abolitionists conspired together and they created a secret code system by putting symbols inside the quilts to help them to navigate. They gave them symbols how yeah. to go from one place I to the next. I remember that. I remember that. So it's time. The, the bell at the top, when the school was destroyed during the Civil War, the, one of the buildings that lasted through the, all the destruction and the burning of the school was the ring building. Okay. And one of the people that rang it was an African American. An African American would ring the bell because the chancellor of the school basically said, "No, we're still here. It's yeah. not going away." This is the second oldest institution after yeah. Harvard University. Then on this side, this is the imagined future. And so, I got this woman's face, the second woman's face, and this third woman's face, and all these different colors like a kaleidoscope. Yeah. That's all the different races and ethnicities all blended together. That's what we look like. Yeah. We are all blended. We are truly a gumbo. Yeah. And that's what we should be championing. Out of her mouth flows a spirit, a spirit of love. And that's, again, what we should be projecting. That is one of the original house structures of the Powhatan. But it's also dubbed, it's superimposed onto the United States Capitol, which is also right down the way from the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I'm sorry, the Washington Monument. And then this building here, that's the ring building, and I pushed them all together. And Louis Armstrong blowing on his horn and with his white handkerchief, which is again another symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so I created three of those within the composition to create the Trinity. So that's one Holy Spirit, two Holy Spirit, and the third one is around her. Yeah. All the way down to our earring, which is the Sankofa. Ah, uh, the bird. The look into one's past in order yeah. to move forward. So the whole piece, it's called Lemonade. A picture of America. Now I'm making a little play on words too. Because you make a picture of Lemonade. Yeah. No, this, a is a, this is a picture of America. Of America. Yeah. <laughs>